notched on the gridiron in September. Perfected in the magic of March. For the fans who love the crunch of the pads, prefer a dunk and expect nothing but the best. It's Bigger Ten. Here's Steve Dace. Indeed, it is Bigger Ten, and the most wonderful time of the year is here. I'm Steve Dace alongside my co-host, but never partner, the one and only Aaron McIntyre, brother. The football season, the fuse ball has arrived. We watched some games last week. There are 81 games on the pallet over the next five days for the opening weekend of college football. Brother, are you ready to go? You know it. You know it. I mean, I think last week I might have mentioned in in passing that YouTube TV is about to uh, supposedly launch a new feature called Mosaic where you can have four streams at once on one monitor. I need that to happen. But in the meantime, I've got my external computer monitor set up in my man cave because I don't use that for my actual computer anyway. So I can have the double and boy, that looked awesome last weekend. I watched, I mean, just I, I drank it in. I drank it in. I watched most of New Mexico State versus Nevada, and man, that was a bad game. But I you watched it. my my New Mexico State money line pick not pay off because they dominated As, the game, but turned it over five times. Yeah, yeah. they should have gone to that backup quarterback. Like, yeah, not that I'm in bitter. The first quarter. Yeah, not that I'm bitter, but you know, I did actually win an even more sizable money line bet last weekend. Let's start there with our big five on bigger ten. That's why you're Nebraska again. Aaron, we have been playing intercollegiate football since Rutgers and Princeton first teed it up. Toe met leather in 1869. This has never happened before. No team has ever suffered nine consecutive losses when they were all by one score. It has never occurred. Scott Frost is now 5-21 and 21 in one-score games. And I could see what he was trying to do with the onside kick. Oh, sure. Which is, hey, I, I don't want our teams to clench, you know? So Let's be aggressive. Let's be aggressive. Yeah. The problem is they were already up by two scores. Yeah. So it, <laughs> it wasn't like they just took the lead and they're like, let's try to you know jump on them now. They were already up by two scores. They had all the momentum in the game. They blew not one, but two Double-digit yep. leads in this game. Northwestern did not score more than 17 points in a Big Ten Conference game last season. They scored that in the first half against Nebraska. They had over 500 yards of total offense. I mean, like it says up there, different year, same story for the Huskers. And, oh, by the way, in case you're wondering, Scott Frost buyout goes from $15 million to $7.5 million after October the 1st. Just saying. There's very little we can say about this that probably hasn't already been said over the last three or four days, but we still have to talk about the fact that after Sean Eichhorst, the Nebraska athletic director, <laughs> I have to bring this you up. You Iowa fans are never going to let this go, to, and I dig that about I, you. I have to bring this up. <laughs> after he said, I, w- when was it, uh, 2015, The twenty? no, it would have been the 2014 Iowa-Nebraska game. That was Bo Pelini's final year as Nebraska head coach. They fired Bo Pelini. Sean Eichhorst asked why after you know a, a winning season. I think they won eight or nine games beating Iowa, their border rival, asking why after beating Iowa you fire your head coach. Eichhorst said, we just have to take stock of where Iowa is as a, as a program. They have not beaten Iowa since. Bo Pelini, Bo Pelini. Scott Frost would have to win 50 consecutive games, and he Ugh. still would not have as good of a coaching record as Bo Pelini. That's one of the most unbelievable stats I've ever heard in my life. Say so, that again. I, it, Scott Frost would have to win 50 consecutive gr- games and it still would not have as good of a coaching record as Bo Pelini. So that, I, I, I don't know how you fix this, Urban Meyer. I don't know how you fix this, Urban Meyer. I, <laughs> you just, it's cosmic, man. You would have thought one of these, one of these last nine 
the ball would have rolled the wrong way for the Eventually. wrong team. Yes. Um, but no, it just it did not. I will say that wasn't an entertaining game. Yes, though. it was. It was a very entertaining game. Yep. And um, the kind of segues into what we'll talk about next. Well, let's talk about that uh, because, you know, it takes two to tango here. Northwestern was was already playing a very good football game. Uh, and in and, and contrast, so so Frost tries to send a message to his team with the onside kick, doesn't work, gives Northwestern a short field, they go down and immediately score, and you could just, I mean, the sphincters in, in Big Red were puckering like David Duvall on the final group of a Masters with Tiger Woods back in the day. Like, you knew the meltdown was on, right? On the other hand, there was a moment towards the end of the first half when Northwestern did the, you know, the play you know I hate. There are two plays I just hate, loathe, despise. Wildcat, hate. Hate should be banned. Hate it. The other is, let's go out there and fake like we're going to snap it on fourth down to draw them off sides and waste a timeout. I hate that play. Northwestern comes out. It looks like that's what they're doing, right? And then they go ahead and snap it and go for it in their own territory on yep. fourth and about a half a yard. They get it. They go down the field and score a touchdown. And I thought that was Pat Fitzgerald right there mm-hmm. sending a message to his team. And look at the way that his team responded. That's culture right there. First of all, we should have all known better than to bet against a Fitzgerald in Ireland, <laughs> right? Secondly, I put on the Bigger Ten uh, Twitter account the morning of the game, looking at the history of these two te- of these two coaches. The fact that you're getting Pat Fitzgerald at plus 420 on the money line, don't you at least have to take a flyer? Yeah. So I did. That was a pretty nice pay- payday. Yeah. You know I'm already a Pat Fitzgerald slappy. That was a little frosting on the cake there for Patty. Appreciate that. And you had Northwestern coaches running smack with 2 a.m. tweets. Did you see this? No. Run, running tweets, or dropping tweets at 2 a.m. local time, which means, you know, they had been out uh, doing the pub crawl. And Northwestern with a huge win. And here we are. The even year Northwestern thing is it back on again. This is your division, man. And they've been a thorn in y'all's saddle oh, yeah. too over there in Iowa City. So yeah. what say you? First of all, they had to do the same thing twice in the same game, which was settle down, settle down the temp- tempo. Mm-hmm. Dude, for somebody who recruits at Northwestern's level, and I'm saying this as an Iowa fan, I'm not like talking that far down to them, but they don't recruit nearly at the level that most of the teams, even in their own division, recruit at. Mm -hmm. To be able to be as well coached as you are, just to be able to slow the game down is such a huge accomplishment and got it down kind of towards their speed. And uh, just it, it was a coaching clinic because here's the difference between the Scott Frost gamble and the Pat Fitzgerald gamble. They were trying to send the same message, as you definitely pointed out, they were trying to send the same message to their team. One was a high percentage play. One was a low percentage play. And the the guy who took the risk on the higher percentage play, and I shouldn't say that's a high percentage play, but it is a much higher percentage play than a, a surprise onside kick. That's the guy who knows how to pick and choose his spots, and that's a guy who has a lot of experience so uh, hats off to Northwestern. I thought this was a, a great win for them. I will say, however, I need to see a little bit more before we do the even year thing. Uh, defense, you know, it was good. They made plays when it really mattered. But Nebraska, uh, for chunks of that game, was kind of moving the ball at ease, at least through the air anyway. Um, I will say, that, though, as well, this is, again, hats off to Pat Fitzgerald. They messed up. They messed with Casey Thompson's head like no Crazy. doubt. No I, I doubt. Just, that's again, that's good scheme, good coaching. But uh, I, I, I thought they looked better than last year. I don't know if they are win the Western division good so far. I'm going to need to see a little bit more. The thing that would concern me if I were in your division is that Northwestern got 500 yards in a Big Ten conference game. There have been a lot of Northwestern teams that won nine or 10 games that never got 500 yards in a Big Ten conference game. Now, there's going to be some regression to the mean, right? I mean, Ryan Holinsky was spectacular for much of the game for Northwestern, but that's clearly, I mean, there's the game he played in Ireland, and then there's the rest of his career up until that point. One of these things is not like the other. That offensive line, though, with Pete Skaronsky might be the number one offensive tackle picked in the NFL draft. Those two running backs, Hull, Porter, they're legit. But if they are able to add that level of a, of a variable on offense— 
I can see looking at it both ways. I can see if I'm a West Division veteran like you saying, eh, I got to see Northwestern get 500 yards in a game again. As a, because that's it didn't look the way at Northwestern. It's also Nebraska. It, yeah, it did, but North, Nebraska's defense has been good the last couple of years, but they clearly lost a lot. But that's not the way Northwestern usually wins football games. So you could, you could spin it and say it's an outlier. That's not their brand of football. They just took advantage of Nebraska's culture and, and uh, you know, head games and weak defense. Fair. You could also spin it the other way and say maybe they found something on offense that expands their horizons a little bit. You're right. We need to know more. But at the very least, between them and the way Illinois looked, I know Wyoming's terrible. They're, I have them rated one of the worst teams in the Mountain West in my preseason power ratings. But that was like a competent, oh, systematic dis, dis demolishing by Illinois. Like, that wasn't fluky at all. They just physically dominated a team. You got to be thinking that division, top to bottom, looks a little bit harder than maybe oh. you were thinking a week ago. Oh, oh I, I agree with that. In a third quarter, middle of the third quarter, uh, that Illinois game, I was thinking, man alive, why aren't they beating Wyoming a little bit worse than this? And then by the middle of the fourth quarter, I was like, hey, maybe a little self-awareness. This looks like I, I was opening game every, like almost every season, a single year where they'd play some mid-level Mac, yeah. mid-level Mountain West team. It's close through the middle of the third quarter, but then the, the, the legs start to give out. Well, we know who we quarter. are. We're going to run our stuff. Exactly. We'll wear you down. So yeah. that, was, that was my big takeaway. I think Illinois, actually, they have some pretty good wide receivers, at least from what I saw, some playmaking types of people that can find lanes and, and uh, have, has the quickness. I think they might beat somebody they're not supposed to this year. All right, let's talk now about week one. Now that we discussed week zero, I, is it possible for there to be less buzz about a game with these two brands, both these teams ranked in the top five, but I don't know what the line is right now at the time you and I are recording this. The last I saw, the line on the Michigan State-Western Michigan game, and Western Michigan lost like everybody from last year's team. The line on the Michigan State-Western Michigan game was minus 21. The line on Ohio State Notre Dame was minus 18. All right, this is the first pre game of preseason top five teams in a season opener we've had since Alabama, Florida State. What was that? I think 2018, 2019. They don't happen a lot. Tyler Buckner is going to be the first Notre Dame quarterback to ever start his first game on the road against a team ranked in the top two. These are arguably the two biggest name brands in the entire history of intercollegiate football that's in prime time. But it feels like this is kind of like Wisconsin against Illinois State. Like, there's like, am I wrong? There's like no palpable buzz for this. Like, we're going to talk about Penn State, Purdue here in a few minutes. I see more buzz about Hell that yeah, one. Hell <laughs> yeah, the buzz for that one is is palpable. You can yeah. feel that. It's like everybody just assumes that, you know, Notre Dame come get your whooping on national TV. Am I wrong on this? That seems to be the overarching narrative going into this one, and I just think there's so many unknowns about Michigan. Uh, I'm sorry, about uh, Notre Dame right now. I, I don't. I don't really know. I don't really know if what the case would be. What the case would be to make this uh, a bit into a bigger matchup or build the buzz a little bit more because I, I just don't. I don't think a lot of people know what we're going to get out of uh, the new coach over in in um, in South Bend. So, um, you know, I. I just don't. Yeah, I don't see that very much right now. I think the only case, the only case that I can make for this game to be close, is if Notre Dame's offense is, you know, competent to above average, and Ohio State still doesn't really look that much improved on defense. Otherwise, you know, Ohio State's offense maybe early on won't click right away, but they're going to get their their sea legs under them. So I, I, yeah, I, I don't really see much buzz about this game, but I can't really blame anybody. So Marcus Freeman, of course, former Buckeye standout, he's coming back home to coach Notre Dame. And I, I just, I can go back and forth on this game. I don't see a lot of, I think Notre Dame is the team in, in the eight, every year since 1989, at least one team, except for one, every year but one since 89, at least one team in the preseason AP top 10 finished the season unranked. And I actually think Notre Dame is the team that's most likely to do it this year. They lost a ton from that team uh, from the last couple of years. I'm not really a huge Tyler Buckner guy at quarterback. And I, I think way too much uh, hosannas are being feted at a guy 
who just a few years ago was a mid-major uh, defensive coordinator and you know lost a bowl game to Oklahoma State in his first year. So we'll see. I mean, I don't know. Marcus Freeman, maybe he's about to be the greatest 0-2 coach of all time. However, I could spin this the other way, too, and say, when I think Notre Dame's overrated, like I don't think they're going to go like 7-5. and five. Okay, I could see them being like eight and four, nine and three, sure. fringe top twenty-five, but not a f- top five team. Yeah, what you tell those guys though? What is it? Uh, it's been eight months. You're getting your asses kicked. Yeah. Don't even show up. Yeah, this is that, like oh, that's an awful lot of motivation to throw at a team with the pride and prestige of a Notre Dame. So, on paper, I don't see a lot of matchups that go Notre Dame's favor. But in terms of intangibles, man, whatever your best shot is. At this stage in an opening game, I think Ohio State will get it. It may not be that good of a shot right now. We don't know. But if if you have any pride as a fighting Irish player at all, hearing this for eight months has got to be some added motivation for you. Yeah, I mean, you're making the same same, um, kind of sell that I made to you last year about Michigan. You're still really talented. You've still got a lot of ability on that team. You keep keep hearing all offseason that you're just dead meat not even ranked in the top 25. Your coach doesn't want to be there, can't beat Ohio State. You hear that over and over and over and over again. And look what happened with Michigan last year as well. Uh, So, yeah, I I guess that is the one X factor here is just being told that you're chopped liver, you're just the sacrificial lamb on national television week one. But we'll see. That's why they play the games. All right, speaking of Michigan, defending Big Ted champs, and it feels glorious to get to say that again. Um, I did an entire episode on my thoughts about how Michigan's going to handle the quarterback battle now. Cade McNamara will start against uh, the incumbent, will start against Colorado State. J.J. McCarthy will start against uh, Hawaii uh, in two weeks, and then they'll figure out what they're going to do and go from there. That's how close the battle was coming out of camp. I broke down all my thoughts in, right here on the same channel uh, in, in this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. So no point in me repeating all of that. So Aaron... Your thoughts. The floor is yours. Give me the outsider viewpoint on this. I wish I wish teams, I wish this was more common practice. And, you know, in the NFL, obviously it is because they have, you know, expendable games that they can do that right. in August. But um, with Michigan, you're kind of in the same boat right now. You have a really, really soft, especially non-conference schedule. So you can afford to, to throw one guy in there that week and then another guy the next week. Um, here's what you don't want. So... Here's what you really, really want. You want one guy to look demonstrably better. Eye test, everything, stats, everything. You want one guy to really separate himself. Here's what you don't want. You don't want a similar, tepid stat line from both. So one might play really better, play a lot better. But if you're the fan base, now this is, I'm speaking as fans here, obviously, if you're the fan base, you don't want to have, hey, we have uh, lukewarm and lukewarm over here. I don't think that's what you're going to get. I think uh, the better thing is that both of them have equally, both of them have 350 yards of passing in both games and three touchdown passes and 20 yards on the ground. Yeah, they're even, but at least, you know, you're working with something that's really, really uh, good or at least making the most of their opportunity. So even though it would be a hard decision for your coaches, you at least know you're getting, um, you know, uh, ribeye steak and ribeye steak versus Cheez-Its and Cheez-Its. That makes sense. So uh, I think this is being set up, though, to go the, with the younger guy. You know, if you're even in camp, always isn't the rule you always go with the, the higher upside with the with the youth. So I think that's what this is setting up for. All right, we just agreed a few minutes ago that we thought there was far more palpable buzz for this one. That's Thursday night, this year's Fox primetime Big Ten opener. Purdue hosting Penn State, spread right now three to four points, depending on where you look. And I I think we, we could look back at the end of the year and look at this game as being one of the springboards to the results we saw. If you're Penn State, uh, and and... It's fascinating. The forecast on them are I've moved a really hot or cold. I've either moved past James Franklin after the last two years, or I think they could be this year's Michigan with the way they recruit, right? Well, you come out here and lose this game, and you're still staring down the barrel of a road game at Auburn, and I don't think Auburn's great. That's still a road game, though, down in the SEC against a respectable program. That's certainly no cakewalk. You could be looking at two losses, man, before we even get to October, before we even start playing. 
those tough division games, right? So you wonder, what, you know, how much this game means for Penn State's momentum. But then even if Penn State wins it, hey, dude, they just won at Wisconsin in this exact same spot last year, yeah. right? Yeah. And still went, what, you know, seven and six. On the other hand, if Purdue wins it, if you look at the fact they don't play Michigan, Ohio State, and they've already banked a win over Penn State, they absolutely get into the catbird seat uh, in the Big Ten West because, as we've seen every year since we've had this divisional alignment, Aaron, but one, every year but one, the team that played didn't play two out of the three, Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State, a team that didn't play two out of those three, won that division. Well, Purdue, if they win Thursday, will avoid the, the other two and already have beaten Penn State. That would give them a huge leg up, I think, the rest of the way, barring you know serious injuries like Aiden O'Connell. Yeah, so here's – I'm not sure I'm going to bet this game. I, I really don't – I don't think I will probably. We'll see. Maybe maybe if one team gets up uh, big early in the first quarter. I, I think if you're Penn State – you talked about the intangibles. I think they're actually on Penn State's side. You've had an off season. Everybody's saying – either nobody's talking about you or if they are, it's not necessarily anything super positive. Whereas with Purdue, oh, they've got this amazing quarterback. So the pressure is actually on Purdue, I think, in this game. Playing at home, open up the season under the lights. Sell out crowd. Sell out crowd. That's going to be a lot of pressure on them. Outside of last year when Purdue beat Oregon State, which is a decent Oregon State. It was above 500 Oregon yeah. State team uh, at home. Uh, outside that and discounting the 2020 COVID year, Jeff Brom had not opened the season while Purdue head coach with a win. And this includes teams like Nevada and Northwestern. That Northwestern team, I can't remember what the year that was, but it was one of the better Northwestern teams. But he struggles early in the season. Even last year, the first real test that they had, Notre Dame, they got their, their, their clocks cleaned by Notre Dame. So as you mentioned as well, Penn State is kind of used to the spot, at least just last year, going into that snake pit that is Madison, Wisconsin, and pulling out the win. I think James Franklin will have those guys ready. I don't think it's going to be an easy game for Penn State, but I wouldn't have a problem picking them at all. I, I think I think they have a better chance. I think it's going to be a fascinating game. I think it's going to be a great game, but I would not have a problem picking Penn State. But I'm not sure, again, if I would actually bet this game. Isn't it great to have actual games and stuff yeah. to talk about again? Yeah. It is. All right, we'll come back, play our weekly game of Would You Rather here next. All right, time to play some Would You Rather here on Bigger Ten. And Aaron, we begin with you. Would you rather bet Notre Dame on the money line to upset Ohio State or Western Michigan on the money line to upset Sparty? Because the spreads aren't that much different. There's only, I think last I said, like like I said, last I checked, there was like a two, two and a half point difference in the two. So which money line bet would you rather make? Oh, Western Michigan, I think for sure. <laughs> See, <laughs> this is supposed to be a game between top five teams. I'd yeah. rather bet Western Michigan no, against Michigan I, State. I just think there are way too many questions about Sparty. I think there are more questions about Sparty, in my mind anyway, than there are about Notre Dame. So I would rather I would rather bet Western Michigan on the money line, even though you probably couldn't name a single player. And don't feel bad, neither could I. No, yeah. no, no. Okay. Most people couldn't. Uh, this one is for you. Mind the typo at the end. Would you rather open the season against a top five ranked FCS team or open the season against a mid level MAC team? Oh, definitely the latter. Yeah. I would rather open against a mid level MAC team. Um, what? and why? One is no, I no. Why? Why do you? No, I'm sorry. Should have probably put some more context around that. Why? Why do teams schedule North Dakota State and South Dakota State? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know why. Isn't isn't, isn't their isn't, top line can stand up against your guys, and you don't want that early in the season. Correct. And if you, to me, if I'm scheduling an FCS, I'm you know I'm scheduling like one of the worst teams, and just blowing them out. I don't want to bring in a team like a North Dakota State or South Dakota State that's a top five team, right? That I was bringing in this yeah. weekend, because those guys come in with some form of swagger. And, and as the great prophet Yogi Berra once said, half of this game is 90% mental. Those guys come in with some form of swagger. If, if you punch them in the mouth early, they won't like instantly wilt and say, well, that's supposed to happen to us. If they get a fortunate break, they won't sit there and say, well, you know, we probably won't get another one of those. Meaning that you've actually got to play, you know, watching Iowa State for years play high-end mm -hmm. FCS teams in the opener, I've just watched this play out. Their level of belief is far more than if you played Akron. Like, they're self-aware. Like, they know who they are. They know they're, yeah, we're Akron. 
Okay. You bring in a, a top five or top 10 FCS program, particularly one that's used to being ranked that high, and they come in with it, expectations, n- expectations yeah. and swagger that y- you don't have if you're, if you're, you know, Ball State going to Iowa City instead. So I would much rather play the MAC team. This one's from you. Would you rather be Illinois with a game under its belt or Indiana with no game film for the Illini to watch yet before their Big Ten opener this weekend? And the reason why I ask this question is because in my generation, I mean, I remember Michigan-Notre Dame. It was a big, huge thing when Notre Dame started scheduling a game before Michigan. Like, Michigan thought it was a violation of of the gentleman's agreement. It was a huge advantage. Well, since 2007... So we're going back. So this is your era now, right? Okay. Since 2007, which gives us 15 years of data. Is that a good long data set? Yeah. Teams with a game under their belt are only 43% under the spread against the spread in opening games against te- or when they, when they face a team playing its opening game that hasn't played a game yet, only 43%. That's like the exact opposite of what it was for decades before. All right. So the idea that there's an automatic advantage for having a game under your belt the the point spread, which is the best indicator of power rating and value, says the last 15 years that is not true. So especially in a transfer portal era, we have all these new players. That's Indiana. They were the most active transfer portal program in our league this year, even more than Michigan State. So do you have an advantage by, you know, you're kind of just hanging out. We have no film on you at all. Or would you rather be, you know, Illinois and you got the kinks out? So I... In this spot, I would rather be Illinois, not necessarily under this criteria. I mean, if this was the only criteria that I was trying to make this decision by, I think you make a pretty good case that you would rather be Indiana. But I think for for the Illini, uh, I think they, as they displayed last week, and really um, with increasing uh, success, you know, maybe not uh, game success, but increasing success last season, they have an identity, um, kind of the... the, uh, uh, the identity that sh- that uh, we just uh, discussed earlier, where they're just going to be physical and lean on you, I I trust that more than whatever. I I don't know what Indiana has, and I'm not sure if Indiana knows what they have. I know that uh, Big Ten Network doesn't know what Indiana yeah, has. That was because, a brutal watch, man. So I I would still just rather go with the Illini for different criteria, but that's that's kind of what I think. For those of you who know what Aaron's referring to, he's talking about when uh, the BTN did. Their bus tour to in, at they Indiana. About anything other and it, than the they were there. For, they were there for a full contact scrimmage. Came out of it and found everything to talk about other than the Indiana team. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, final one is for you. Would you rather bet the over on Illinois Indiana at forty five or the over on Iowa South Dakota State at forty four and a half? Oh man, I don't know that I want to bet the over <laughs> through one of those games. Um, I guess I'd rather bet the over on Iowa. Maybe you break a couple of big plays there. And it's, you know, 38-14. I think there's a better chance, I guess, of that. Because I do think Indiana and Illinois is going to be a rock fight. Because I think both coaches want it to be. Like, I, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I think they'd both rather win 31 to nothing. But if they can't win 31 nothing, I think both coaches want the game to be 20-17. to Yeah. Okay. But I don't think I'd want to bet the over on either one of them, actually. All right, that's going to do it for Would You Rather when we come back. Time for some feedback and the Twitter poll question of the week next. This week's Twitter poll results. We asked about the West Division last week. This week we asked you who's going to win the Big Ten East. 71% of you said Ohio State. 23% said Michigan. There you see Michigan State and Penn State in single digits. Do you agree with those results or at least how lopsided they are? No. Man, so I said at the end of last season – I said at the end of last season, now let's see how Michigan does with expectations. There are no expectations for Michigan this year. Right. There are no expectations. We're like kind of right back in the position we were last year without the Harbaugh speculation. Yeah, Yeah. that's what I mean as well. So we'll see. Um, I I still want to see Michigan come out uh, together, you know, uh, as a whole team and not, uh, hey, I'm going to go visit the uh, Minnesota Vikings and uh, try to get a job, an NFL job. But apparently everything I've heard from you, from the BTN bus tour, Everything seems to be on the up and up over there. So I think the lopsided Ohio State number, you know, I would say it's more uh, maybe maybe 60-40 and then 2 or 3 and 3% for Penn State and Michigan State. It still should be said, Michigan has not come out of the horseshoe with a win since 2000. You were, what, 7? Seven? 7, yeah. 7 years old. 
you're married, own your own home, and have a family. Yeah. That <laughs> tells you how. So that was a long time ago. Feedback of the week. This is from William Clock, who says, quote, Adrian Martinez was the problem, end quote. Somewhere in Manhattan, Kansas, there is a quarterback smiling right now. I mean, I when I when he when when Casey Thompson threw that interception and I tweeted out, man, I it's too bad this never happens to Nebraska. A guy who makes some because he, he made some incredible plays yeah. in this game that no one's talking yeah. about right now. Like incredible highlight plays. Thompson had like two of them, but he then throws the pick at the end that costs his team the game. That's exactly what we saw out of Aaron Martinez for four years at Nebraska. The exact same thing. So that brings us now to game week. If you're here on the channel, yes, we're going to do confidence picks again this year. Those will be up there tomorrow right here on the channel. Until then, please like, rate, subscribe, share, five-star review, uh, however and wherever you watch, whether it's right here on iTunes, or I'm sorry, on YouTube, or listen, like on iTunes, please help us to find more Big Ten sports fans just like you. Thank you to all of you that have left us uh, five-star reviews and kind words about the program in the past. We appreciate you. We'd also appreciate it if you followed us on Twitter, at Bigger Ten, in between episodes. Keeps, up, keeps you up to date on what we think about all things Big Ten and more. Until the next time, when we will have a full slate of games to break down, For Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Dace.